Paul, after ex- exclaiming his gratefulness, his gratitude, his thanksgiving for the Thessalonian church, after doing that up to chapter 3, he explains his exhortations, how he wants them to live in his absence. You know, what we learned in First Thessalonians chapter 4, basically uh, verses 1 to 12, is that even in the absence of a great leader like Paul, and Paul certainly was a great pastor, even so, the gates of Hades will not prevail over God's church. Even in Paul's absence, Christ's church continued. God loves his church. He will protect his church. He loves you and he will protect you if you are a Christian, if you are in Christ. And so we could also thank God for what the Lord accomplished through the Thessalonian church, even in the absence of Paul. And I I say that at the beginning of our sermon to stress to you that coming to church, being a part of this church and this congregation should not be a passive activity. This should be an active activity. On the contrary, as I was talking to even some of the pillars in our own church here, some of the men, you know, uh, the, the pastors, they need your prayer. They need your love. They need your encouragement. Sometimes they even need your exhortation, you know. And so I, I want to encourage you too. You, you're a part of this church. You, you need to, you know, you have a role to play, in other words. And I hope by looking at the doctrine of the resurrection today, you'll see that the life you live now should not be an inconsequential one. In other words, not a wasted life. So moving on from verses 1 to 12, where Paul gives two exhortations of holiness and harmonious living, we move into a new subject, which is eschatology. Eschatology. Uh, You know, you guys are a pretty educated crowd, so you probably already know what that means. But, you know, just in case, you know, eschatology comes from a Greek word, eschatos. Eschatos just means last or last days. And um, it's in systematic theology. It's the it's also the last category of systematic theology. Shocking, right? You know, um, it's it talks about the last days. What's going to happen in the end? You know, when Christ comes back, uh, what are we looking forward to? You know, when we opened our sermon today or, or when we uh, had our first scripture reading, we looked at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which talks extensively about the resurrection, and Paul made clear to the Corinthians. In fact, what's interesting, Paul is writing 1 Thessalonians from Corinth at this same time. So he's in real time dealing kind of with a church that's very opposite to the Thessalonians. This is a church that um, they're not abstaining from sexual morality. They're very much engaging in it. Uh, they're not unified. In, they're, they're not harmonious. They have divisions among them. Uh, they, instead of being loving, they're uh, very divided and they have issues with each other. They're, they're, they're not a functional church, unfortunately. But even in that chapter, he reminds them of the resurrection. And we'll get into that here shortly. But what we need to know about the resurrection is that it's designed to give us comfort. It's designed to give us comfort. That's Paul's purpose for saying what, he say, what, what he's about to say in our passage today and then the passage that follows this one. But for now, we'll be in verses 13 to 18. You know, the title of today's sermon in relation to this is The comfort, the Comforts of the Resurrection. The Comforts of the Resurrection. Because it's Paul's purpose that you be comforted by learning about the last days. And in particular, we're going to look at one aspect, just one aspect of the last days, which is the resurrection. We're not going to, there's so much more we could talk about. But for, for now, because the main point of the text is resurrection, that will be our main point for our sermon. And so the title again of today's sermon is The Comforts of the Resurrection. You know, in our passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, Paul provides four comforts uh, concerning the coming resurrection so that Christians will not grieve as others do. Um, I'm going to say them. It, sh- it should not show up in the PowerPoint just yet. But those, com- those four comforts, just so you could write them down if you're taking notes, are number one, the reality of the resurrection. Number one, the reality of the resurrection. And we're going to see that in verse 14. Number two, the second comfort of the doctrine of the resurrection is that the dead will rise first. The dead in Christ will rise first. That's verses 15 and 16. Then the third comfort of today's sermon will be the living and dead in Christ, that is the living and dead saints, we will be reunited with them. We'll be reunited with living and dead saints in verse 17. And then our last comfort, the last comfort of today's sermon will be we will be with Christ for always, for always. And so these are the four comforts that Paul provides to encourage a church that is without its, you might say, church father, their leader, 
uh, uh, you know, their, their well-known loving pastor. They are without him right now. Timothy has been sent to them. We saw that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, but he's also come back to Paul, which is to say they are without Timothy, they're without Silvanus, and they are without Paul. And even so, in God's sovereignty, he is protecting and preserving this church which should give us encouragement too, that God will preserve his church. He will take care of his church, even in the absence of a great, well-known leader. He, the church will go on, and we need not despair. But it is to say, pray for your leaders. We haven't got there yet, but you know, um, it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 5 and 13, it says, But we ask of you, brothers, that you know those who labor among you and lead you in the Lord and admonish you, and that you regard them very highly in love because of their work live in peace with one another. And so I just say that to say, pray for your leaders. You know, they need your prayers. Be an active congregant, not a passive one. But to go back to our passage, our passage starts in verse 13 stating, but we do not want you to be uninformed brothers about those who are asleep so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. Our passage starts with a problem. Now, this should strike you as unique because up until this point, Paul has used phrases like, you have no need for anyone to write you anything. The Thessalonian church is very different from a lot of other churches like Corinth, which had sexual morality and division. Or you might look at the church of Galatia, which uh, they were succumbing to the false doctrine of the Judaizers. Um, The Thessalonian church is not like that. Or even the Ephesian church, which is mostly a good church. It's a church with sound doctrine. But according to Christ himself in Revelation, Revelation chapter 2, they lost their first love. And I know you guys have heard a sermon about that. Some of you have heard a sermon about that. So praise the Lord for that. So you know, uh, there are churches that have different issues and uh, Christ cannot commend all of them. But the Thessalonian church, this is a very commend worthy church. It's not like Ephesus. It's not like Galatia. And it's not like Corinth in that way. But even so, Paul has something to tell them. This is the first thing he says that is not good. There's two problems. First, that they're uninformed. Uh, in other words, they, they're, they're ignorant of a certain thing. They, and unlike what it says, like in, for example, in uh, First, Thess- Thess- First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, uh, you have no need of anything to be written to you. Like that, again, that phrase is repeated multiple times in First Thessalonians. Now they do have something that needs to be written to them. This is something that Paul feels the necessity. No, 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 no. I need to tell you something about this. You need to know this. And so I hope as you hear this sermon, you will join with the saints of old that you would understand you need to know this just as much as they do. This was a church, for all we know, they may have been a lot, who knows, maybe uh, more mature than we are. Despite being a young church, they were a very, very mature church, which is to say the length of time does not determine how how mature a church is. Really, it's how dedicated they are to Christ, how dedicated they are to his word and living it out, which is what the, which is what the case was for the Thessalonian saints. But even so, they needed this. They needed to be instructed concerning the doctrine of the resurrection. And therefore, so do you. So do I. We need to know this. We need to not be uninformed. We need to not be ignorant of this. This is the sort of thing that we'll see at the end of the sermon that if, if you're, how do you apply the doctrine of the resurrection? Okay, that's great. We're going to be raised with the dead. Awesome. What on earth does that mean? Well, you know what that means? That means as life gets harder, you know, like you probably see in the news, like, oh my gosh, there's a pending civil war, global conflict, uh, civil unrest and violence. And you know, who knows? Maybe that could actually happen. We are living in some crazy times, dear saints, beloved. But what I want you to get from this sermon is that you can apply theology. Theology is not meant to stay on your bookshelf. It's meant to be lived out. It's meant to be guarded in your heart and exemplified in your life. So the first way the resurrection will benefit you is it should give you courage, courage to do what is right. The life you live now is not it. It is not the end. And so when you hear stories about violence or war or other sorts of terrible things, which we don't want and we don't hope for, we want, to pro- we want to promote peace, but we must prepare for war if we have to, you know? And one way we do that is prepare by learning the doctrine of the resurrection. By learning the doctrine of the resurrection, it should give you courage, courage to do what is right, courage to live a life that honors God, even when your neighbors hate the life that Christ proposes. When, you know, I don't know, different media outlets are condemning your faith in Christ. The first thing that the resurrection should do for you is give you courage, 
courage to obey God. The second thing it should do for you is give you hope, something to look forward to. This is not all there is. Some people, when they hear about violence or struggle or strife, you know, um, even as the scripture says, you know, eat, drink and be merry because tomorrow we die. You know, some people hear about these awful, wicked things that are happening in our country or the world or even our own city, you know. They hear these sorts of things and despair and think, well, you know what? I'm just going to go and do what I want to do and live for sin, you know? Uh, that ought not be you. Apart from, the, apart from the fact that Christ condemns any sort of immorality or evil, you know, if you truly believe that Christ has risen from the dead, you ought to also believe that you someday will rise from the dead. Your dead loved ones who are in Christ, maybe it's a dead father, mother, uh, and maybe, and later on we'll say even that dead little baby, maybe that you lost, someday if you are in Christ, you will be with them. You'll get to know them. And it's not just going to be a few years or a lot of years. You'll get to know them. It will be forever and ever, everlasting. There's joy that you just don't know, that you just have not comprehended in your life. The best thing that's ever happened to you in your life up to this point doesn't compare to the joy you will know being with Christ. This is something that, by the way, this is not a suggestion. This is a command. You're commanded not to be sexual immoral, sexually immoral. You're commanded to work with your hands, to honor God in the work that you do. And now, inspired by the Holy Spirit, Paul commands the Thessalonian saints and you, dear beloved saint, be comforted, be comforted in the fact, the reality of the resurrection. Do not be ignorant of this, because in being informed of this, you will be courageous to stand for Christ even in the face of civil strife or even death. It should give you hope to look forward to, not to live for this world, but to live for the life to come that is without end and with everlasting joy. And lastly, it should give you peace, peace in the midst of all this strife, in the midst of all the struggle that we hear on the news or YouTube or wherever you get your news or maybe outside on your front lawn, who knows, or, or in your apartment complex, whatever. You know, the fact of the resurrection should cause you to have peace that, you know, the, as bad as things can get in this life or in this world or in your community, this is not the end. Your neighbors may be terrible people. Maybe they're, hopefully they're not. Maybe your neighbors are here. We love you. We all love you, you know, but um, repent and believe, you know. Uh, I want you, and more importantly, Christ wants you to be there in the resurrection. The reality is not all of you will be there. Some of you reject Christ, like, very openly, and some of you not openly. Some of you presuppose yourselves to be Christians, and you're not. If you are not reconciled to Christ, this entire sermon, all the blessings, all the comforts, all the goodness is not for you. It is only for those of you who are in Christ who have already been reconciled to God. That joy is a joy you will not know. You will miss out if you are not in Christ. If you are not in Christ, all these beautiful, wonderful promises of the resurrection, will not, they, they're not for you. You have no reason to be courageous if there's a civil war, if there's a global conflict, if there's civil strife over the election or whatever, you know. Uh, you, you have no reason to be courageous. You have no reason to, you have nothing to look forward to other than hell forever and ever and ever. And you should have no peace in this life. You know, and I, what I tell when I go share the gospel of people, and I would also echo what our, our dear brother Bernie said, if you can, please come out this Saturday to come share the gospel, share the reality of the resurrection with those who are perishing. I don't like calling them lost because they like being lost. They're really perishing. They're dying. Come share the reality of the resurrection, your hope, with those who have no hope. So please, if you would, join us this Saturday to share the gospel. But a part of that, you know, uh, you know a part of of what, we're, what I want to teach here concerning the resurrection is that, again, if, if you are not in Christ, everything I'm about to say does not apply to you. But now moving on uh, to our second problem, our second problem after finding out uh, that, that the Thessalonians, they have a, a necessity that something be written to them because they're uninformed. The second thing that Paul says in the second part of verse 13, he says, I don't want you to be un uninformed brothers about those who are asleep so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. What does he mean by the word asleep? It's a euphemism, which is to say he's, he's using a word to describe some, uh, something else that's not as heavy as the normal word. What he means by asleep is those who are dead. The, you know, these are people who need to be risen, who need to come back from the dead. And so what he means by those who are asleep, these are the dead, people who have already passed away, they're deceased, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. So the second problem we have is that 
He does not want the Thessalonians to grieve as others grieve. We see back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5, it says this, For this reason, when I could endure it no longer, I also sent to know about your faith, lest somehow the tempter has tempted you and our labor be in vain. And so Paul's concern when he writes to the Thessalonians is that, I mean, keep in mind, remember, he's not with them. It's like he describes himself as a parent who's been um, orphaned, is the the word he uses more precisely. He's been torn away from his own children. He loves them. Imagine losing your own children. What a terrible thing that would be. I have a child. It'd be an awful thing to be separated from my child. And so that's how Paul feels about being separated from his spiritual children. Uh, You know, that's how every pastor should feel being separated from his own people. You know, it should be be, uh, be a feeling of being orphaned. Orphaned. And so the, concerning that feeling of being orphaned, he's, he doesn't want them to be tempted to despair or that what they're doing be in vain. What does he mean by that? Like, how, how would they, the labor that they do be in vain? Well, it's to say without the resurrection, if you die, you know, if this is all there is, if you don't end successful, then it's all a waste. You might think about those people who go share the gospel at a, maybe a different continent somewhere far away from here and and, and then, then they die. Maybe you've heard the story of the broken spears. Like I think the, the men who went out there initially, they went to share the gospel and the tribesmen, uh, they, they killed them and cannibalized them. And so we, we, you could look at that from a worldly perspective and say, well, that was totally a failed mission trip. You know, uh, zero success. But for anyone who knows the story, you know that the Lord, uh, you know, did a mighty great work over there. You know, afterward, uh, their, their wives, the women went over, you know, after their own manly husbands. And then truly these were real men. These were men had died, they went over to give the gospel to other men who had murdered their own husbands to bring the same gospel. And by the grace of God, the Lord enlightened their hearts to receive the gospel so that those tribesmen, I, I forgot, somewhere in Africa, but they, they, you're going to see them in heaven. The same men who cannibalized those men in the story of the broken spears, if you're in Christ, you're going to see them at the resurrection. Could you believe that? That is the mighty work of our God. That's what he does. You know, Paul, even the apostle Paul, who used to persecute Christians, He's, he is now having fellowship with people he persecuted. He's, he, he has met Stephan. Stephan, who we saw in Acts chapter 9, who he held the clothes for the others who murdered him mercilessly on the floor by casting stones at him. Paul has peace and fellowship with Stephan now. It's an amazing and beautiful thing. That is the greatness of our God. But what, what we need to know is Paul's concern that he doesn't want them to despair that their labor is in vain uh, because of how things are going in this world. You might feel the same way. Oh, my goodness. Uh, you know, our, our cities, you know, you know, there's violence or it's being overrun with people who want to do bad things or our government. Like, I don't even know what's going to happen at the election or all these sort of terrible things that are happening. What you need to know is the resurrection should give you hope that this you, do, you need not despair when. You know, I mean, there, there's so many things we could despair about. Like there was a second attempted assassination of President, former President Trump. You know, uh, people are concerned, hey, is this going to be a fair election? Maybe some of you have heard that, you know, even a famous pastor, you know, had to step down from ministry recently. There's all sorts of reasons to despair and think, man, if that happened to him, what about me? Or, you know, or, or I don't know, like maybe in more of the political realm, like if that happened to Trump, like there's no hope for us, you know. But that ought not be the case. Whatever happens to Trump, Whatever happens, you know, to any famous pastor need not affect your hope in Christ. We, you know, understandably, we, we lament those things, but we look forward to the hope that we have in Christ. And so we need not grieve as others grieve. And so those are our problems. He doesn't want the Thessalonians to be uninformed, and he doesn't want them to grieve as the rest do. And so what is the solution? That brings us to our first point. Our first point is the reality of the resurrection. The reason they need not be uninformed or what they need to be informed about is the resurrection. What will give them hope not to grieve or think that their labor is in vain is the reality is that there is a resurrection. Verse 14 reads this, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. So what we have here in chapter 14 is a, condition, a conditional statement, an if and then clause, if you will, or even so in some translations. So the conditional statement is, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, if you believe that, I mean, essentially, if you're a Christian, that's what you have to believe. If you do not believe that Christ has rose from the dead, then there is no hope for you. That's what Paul said in our, the, the scripture we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If there is no resurrection for Christ, then there is no resurrection for you. And if you don't believe in the resurrection, like how could Christ have rose from the dead? And so 
if you believe this, and he presupposes that the Thessalonians, who, is a, who are a good church, he presupposes that they do believe this. And so he says, if you believe that Jesus died and rose again, which I know you do, then here's the consequent of our clause. Even so, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. This is something that is real. This is something that's going to happen. He will bring those who have fallen asleep in Christ Jesus. If you would, join me to 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 15. We're going to read a little bit more about this resurrection of the dead. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15. There we go. Oops. So it's going to be 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 and 21. We'll just read that for now. You might want to keep a bookmark on 1 Corinthians chapter 15 because we'll be coming back to this passage quite frequently. But it says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20 and 21. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. So we see here in our text, you know, right after talking about, hey, if there's no resurrection, you are to be pitied above all men. But here Paul tells him, and kind of his common fashion by no means, in other words, but Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by a man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. So who's that man who brought death? He's talking about Adam, the first man in Genesis chapter 3. By his sin, we die. You see, you weren't created to die. You were designed and created to live forever. But because of Adam's sin and because of your sin too, you die, which is to say when we die, we deserve it. We merit it. Death was, you weren't destined for death. You were destined to live. But because of Adam's sin, because of the evil that you do, you do die, which is to say death is not a neutral thing. We die because we're bad people. We die because we're evil. That's why we die. It's not a good thing. It's not something to celebrate. It's, it's bad. But someday God will deal with death ultimately through, and he has, through the second man, the second Adam, the better Adam, which is none other than Christ, our King, our Lord, who you serve if you are a Christian. Christ, unlike the first man, through his obedience did not bring death, but brought resurrection. He brought life instead of death. And so if you believe Christ, not just believe in him because Satan and his demons, they believe in Christ too. And they're going to rot in hell forever and ever. But it's a case that you must believe him. Like if maybe, you know, I think everyone here has been a kid. Some of you still are, and that's okay. That's awesome. You know, but you know, maybe your kids, maybe your parents have told you like, hey, do this when you're a child. And you know, you know what it's like, okay, I believe you, you know, um, so you obey them. Or if you don't, you don't. And, and then you get spanked or something, you know? And so it's the case that Christ doesn't just want you to believe in him. He calls you to believe him, to do what he says. The evidence of your faith in God, according to James, is your obedience. You're acting out. You're doing what he says. That is how you show that you love Christ. According to John chapter 14, it says, whoever loves me keeps my commandments. Whoever doesn't love me does not keep my commandments. And so we need to know first that the resurrection is a reality. The resurrection is a reality. It's something that is going to happen. And I want to emphasize, too, that the resurrection is not something that's being invented. This isn't the first time. Like, you might ask, like, okay, that's great. And we sort of read passages like this and glance, like, gloss over it. Like, let's get to something good. Like, let's get to the Antichrist. That'll be cool, you know? Uh, but uh, what, what we need to see here, too, is that uh, Paul's not just inventing this. I mean, of course, he's being divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this. But this isn't the first time the resurrection is talked about. If you go to Matthew chapter four, uh, 24... Jesus speaks about it there, too. Jesus speaks about the resurrection in Matthew 24. If you'll join me there, Matthew 24, 29 to 31. In Matthew chapter 24, prior to, you know, his his crucifixion, Jesus also sought to give comfort to his own apostles in Matthew chapter 24. We'll read verses 29 and 31 for now. Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 and 31 it says this 
But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. And so God is going to gather his elect. You know, and I want to bring up another passage, John chapter 5, verse 25 to 29. So if you'll join me in a fellow gospel, John chapter 5, John chapter 5, verse 25, it reads this, John chapter 5, verse 25 to 29, it says this, reading in verse 25, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life. Those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Uh, yeah, so we'll, that's all I'll read for now. You know, so what we see in these two passages, and forgive me, I read Matthew 24 probably a little prematurely, but, but these are still both good passages for us to read in light of our text because John 5, 25 to 29 tells us there, there's going to be a resurrection. Christ is trying to encourage and comfort his own apostles. So even before the apostle Paul ever tried to comfort Christians like ourselves, Gentiles, Jesus was comforting his Jewish disciples with the same reality, the same truth that there is a resurrection to look forward to. This is not the end. You will, the dead, those in the tombs will be raised from the dead. And he thought, he, according to Christ, Christ himself, they needed to know this so that they could be comforted, so they could be bold and stand before, you know, I don't know, uh, like Felix, uh, you see him in the book of Acts, basically different people, different, uh, you know, uh, magistrates, uh, rulers, and powers to de- boldly declare the gospel to them. How could they do so if this is the only life there is? So to embolden them, to give them courage to obey, to do the right thing, Christ informs them. He doesn't leave them uninformed, but he rather he informs them about the resurrection that is to come. And so now we know that the resurrection is a reality. It's not something imaginary. I think something also good to know is uh, it wasn't just that Christ had told his apostles about the resurrection, but if we look at Acts 23, 6 and 8, we'll see that uh, there was another group of people that also believed in the resurrection. If you'll join me to Acts chapter 23, verses 6 and 8. Acts chapter 23, verses 6 and 8. In Acts chapter 23, verses 6 and 8, it says this. I'll go ahead and throw in chapter 7 too. Free of charge, don't worry. But knowing that one group were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, Paul began crying out in the Sanhedrin, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. I am on trial for the hope and resurrection of the dead. As he said this, there was dissension between the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor an angel, nor a spirit. But the Pharisees acknowledge them all. So why are we reading this? We're reading this to show that the belief in the resurrection is not not just a New Testament reality, but it's also an Old Testament reality. We'll look at Daniel uh, chapter 12 here shortly, but maybe you could pull that up while, while I'm talking. But, you know, uh, for now, what we need to know is that the Pharisees themselves, these are the Jewish religious leaders, they believed in the resurrection. They knew there was a life to come. You know, they, they kind of get a huge bad rap because they are the bad guys uh, in the Gospels. But, you know, um, we have to understand, like, in their context, you know, uh, to, to the Christians in their time, the Pharisees were almost viewed as like the good guys. The they weren't, by the way. They weren't. Don't be mistaken. The Pharisees were the bad guys. But in their time, in their context, people would look at the Pharisees and think, well, surely these are the good guys. Like, these are the guys doing the preaching conference circuits. You know, that, that would kind of be their equivalent. That's who the Pharisees would be. They would be more like the conservative evangelicals is who they would be. And unfortunately, even the conservative uh you know, followers of God weren't really followers of God, unfortunately. But what I want to show just by quoting this text of Scripture in Acts chapter 23, 6 and 8, is just the Pharisees also, who knew the law exceedingly well, they believed in the resurrection. 
they knew there was going to be a resurrection. And, and, you know, we also learn a little bit about Paul. You know, he was a Pharisee at one time, too. And as a Pharisee, he believed the resurrection. And we learn from our own passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 and 18, even when he's not a Pharisee anymore, he still believes the resurrection. And so it's true. Um, but uh, how do they know there's a resurrection? What, what's the deal with that? Like, where are they drawing this from? There's, there's multiple places we could look in the Old Testament to show it. But for now, if, we'll, if you'll just join me to Daniel chapter 12, we're just going to look there for now in Daniel chapter 12. In Daniel chapter 12, we see there's also going to be a resurrection of the dead. Daniel was a prophet. He was born in exile, unfortunately. He was taken into exile to initially the kingdom of Babylonia, which is modern-day Iraq. And uh, I believe, I don't know, he might be, he's not in the Babylonian Empire in chapter 12. He'd actually lived long enough to go through multiple empires, the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Median Empire, and I believe that's where he is right now. And so in that context, he says what he says. So um, let's see. We're going to go ahead and read Daniel chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. It says this, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to reproach and everlasting contempt. And those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead the many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But as for you, Daniel, con- sorry, I'm going on, going on to verse 4. But as for you, Daniel, conceal these words and seal up the book until the time of the end. Many will go to and fro, and knowledge will increase. So there's a couple of things to draw from this passage. First, our, basically our point, the reality of the resurrection. Even in the Old Testament, Old Testament saints who are followers of God just as much as you are, they believed in a coming resurrection. They believed that this life was not all there is. There's a life to be had. And so, and by the way, what we learn from our text here too is that the resurrection is not just for Christians. It's not just for followers of God. If you reject Christ, if you are not a Christian here, you will have a resurrection too, but a resurrection to judgment, to everlasting contempt, uh, what we call hell, what uh, Revelation calls the lake of fire, the place destined for Satan and his angels, the demons. That is where you will be forever and ever if you are not in Christ. But lastly, we look at verse four. He says, But as for you, Daniel, conceal the words and seal up the book until the time of the end. Many will go to and fro, and knowledge will increase. What does he mean by that? This is just to say, you know, this is another doctrine in theology we learn, like uh, it's called progressive revelation, which is to say that as time goes on, God is increasingly revealing himself more and more and more. This is not to say, hey, does that mean we'll have new books? Should I buy Jesus Calling or something like that? No, you shouldn't. Stay away. You know, if you need some firewood, you know where to go. But, you know, um, and if you like it, uh, we could talk afterward, you know, but... Um, what it, this is to say that, you know, God throughout human time and space, he's revealing a little bit more and more of himself. You know, uh, for example, you know, when he revealed himself to Abraham, he revealed himself as God Almighty or El Shaddai. You know, later on, we see that he reveals him, his name uh, to the Jewish people in the book of Exodus to Moses. He tells like, like, hey, what who do I say sent me? So tell them I am that I am sent you Yahweh, the self-existent one, the eternal one who's also the, the one who was, the one who is, and the one who is to come, you know, the one of revelation. He, that is Yahweh. Christ is Yahweh, in case you're wondering, you know. Sorry to ruin it, but that's, that's how the story ends, you know. And so uh, this, again, I just want to emphasize the, the progressive revelation of things. But even back then, even in the Old Testament, we see the reality that there will be a resurrection for believers and unbelievers alike, some to glory and brightness and goodness and others to darkness and shame and suffering. So, again, coming back to our passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, what is the first comfort? The first comfort that you need to claim, that you need to believe as a Christian, as the, is that there is a resurrection. This is not all there is. You're going to die, but you, that death is not the end of the story. You're going to stand before God, and you're either going to enjoy him forever and ever and ever, or you're going to suffer forever and ever uh, being left out, you know, maybe you've been left out before, like, I don't know, at a party or something like that, and that's not cool, it's not enjoyable. How terrible it will be to be left out and kept out of heaven. Don't let that be you. If you're here today, if you are, have not made, if if you have not been reconciled to Christ, if Jesus is not your Lord, you need to get right with God. I want to see you there at the resurrection and not in hell. You want to see you there to enjoy fellowship with you forever and ever. We'll, we'll get there to the third comfort, which is, you know, we'll be reunited. But if you're not in Christ, again, that promise is not for you. 
It's only for those who are in Christ. So that brings us to our second comfort, our second comfort in verses 15, 16, which is that the dead will rise first. Now, this is kind of interesting. So we've already heard in verse 14, okay, you know, the, those who are asleep or those who are dead in Jesus, they're going to rise. They're going to come back to life. Great. Why does Paul feel the necessity to say what he says in verses 15 and 16, that the dead in Christ will rise first? Well, uh, basically, you know, uh, here's what you need to know. I mean, like uh, when Christ, like in Matthew, if you want to look at uh, Christ teaching about eschatology or the last days, you can look at Matthew 24. That's kind of the, the main chapter of eschatology from Christ's own words. Or you can look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That's the most important chapter, I might say, in all of Scripture concerning the resurrection, even more than our passage. But we, but we look at, you know, both because we're reading it right now. Uh, but in both of those, we find... Um, we, we find that, uh, you know, Christ speaks about the resurrection, he speaks about the end times, and he speaks about his coming as imminent, which is to say it could happen at any time. Christ can come right now. He can come the next hour or tomorrow or next week or next year, whenever. He, he could show up at wh- whatever time. And so the c- one concern early Christians had was that, uh, you know, they, they really believed Early Christians really believed Christ was going to come at any moment, like maybe even in their generation. And so their fear, some had, you know, again, not everyone had a Bible like you and I have. So they didn't have scripture to flip around through. So they, they just kind of got whatever Paul told them. And so until they had a full Bible, some of them were kind of worried, like, man, if Christ comes back now, what do we do? Like we're being persecuted by our own countrymen, which we learned in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter uh, three, no, chapter two, sorry. Uh, some of them have died. Some of them have died. Maybe some have been murdered or beat up or something. Uh, what about them? Does this mean they're not going to be there for the resurrection? They're not going to be there for Christ's return? They're going to miss out? By no means. According to verse 15, 16, it says this, for this we say to you by the word of the Lord, which is to say this is authoritative. This isn't my opinion. This is coming from God himself. We say this to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. That's to say, hey, we're not going to go before them. Don't worry. Your, your dead mom or dad or grandpa or grandma or, or, or child in Christ, they're, we're not going to go before them when it comes to Christ's return. They're going to be there. And not only that, they're going to come first. They're going to be there first with the Lord. And so this would give comfort to the Thessalonian saints who have probably lost some loved ones in the church who they cared about. Uh, And so now they know, according to verse 15, they're not going to precede them. Instead, in verse 16, it says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. So again, he's saying, emphatically, the dead in Christ will rise first. So you don't have need to worry, Paul or uh, not Paul, but Thessalonian, you know, the the dead in Christ, they'll rise first. Christ has not forgotten them. They will be there for the resurrection. There's three things that will uh, accompany that resurrection in our verse. In verse 16, he says, first, there's going to be a shout and then a voice of the archangel and then the trumpet of God. You know, that voice, uh, if you would, let me just get my notes here. The voice he's talking about, these are two separate things, by the way, so we're not going to mush them together. But the voice, we already read the passage, but I want us to go back together because these are these are texts I hope you'll remember for your life. When you leave this place, when it's next week, if I'm not here for whatever any reason, I hope these are verses that you will hold dear in your heart when life gets hard. If there's ever a civil war, pray that that doesn't happen, by the way. We don't want that. We want to pray for peace, you know, live peaceful peaceably with all people, but you know as far as it depends on you, according to Romans chapter 12, but, you know, we got to do what we got to do, but we want peace, but uh, I want these words to comfort you, like Paul wanted them to comfort you, which is to say, really, the Holy Spirit, God, the third person of the Trinity, he wants these words to comfort you, and so go with me to John chapter 5, verses 25 to 29, again, if you would, John chapter 5, verses 25 to 29, we were already there, but I just want to read it a second time, so that maybe, hopefully, it will stick with you a little closer, John 5, 25 to 29, John chapter 5, verses 25, 29. And what I want you to pay attention this time as we read it, again, I want you to see the resurrection, but I want you to pay attention to the voice, the voice that you're going to hear here. It says, these are Christ's words. He says, "True." this is verse 25, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and it now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. So uh, I guess we could also look at... Um, 
verse 28, if you go down to verse 28, it says, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. Again, voice. And will come forth. Uh, before we move on with verse 29 there, I just want to emphasize, this is what Paul's alluding to. You know, uh, we learn in Galatians that, you know, he was partially discipled by some of the apostles. Or so these are some of the things he would have received. Uh, he's traveling with a certain member of his team who is often not mentioned, but this man is named Luke. He's a physician. He wrote the Gospel of Luke. He also wrote Acts. And Luke, you know, he interviewed all the apostles. And so this would be something Luke is familiar with. And so likely Paul himself would be familiar with as well, not including the fact that, you know, Paul actually had a vision of Christ multiple times. So, I mean, he's actually met Christ, uh, which is a part of what qualifies him to write scripture, you know, uh, versus like someone else like Silvanus and Timothy. They're not writing scripture. It's Paul, you know. But uh, what we need to see in John chapter 5, verses 25 to 29, is that this is what Paul means by the voice. This is the voice that's going to be crying out. It's going to be raising the dead. This is not to be confused with the trumpet, which we'll look at here afterward, but there's going to be a voice that raises the dead, which will be none other than Christ's voice with the power of the archangel. So, um, And then also in verse 29, it says, And will come forth those who did the good deeds of the resurrection to life and those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Don't miss this. This is to say the resurrection in one sense is for everyone. You may not be a believer here. You may completely reject this. You might think this is pure hogwash, rubbish, if you will, fairy tales. Well, this isn't. I mean, it's the, the, you will know the resurrection as well. You will know the reality of coming back to life. But unlike those who are in Christ, it will be to everlasting contempt to suffering. That is your future. And, you know, I say this, you know, kind of a, especially in light of the evangelism that's going to come this next week. You know, what I, what, what I share with unbelievers, you know, is you should live now. You know, maybe you've heard someone say, maybe I won't name the name, but, you know, uh, God wants your best life now. Maybe you've heard that in a famous book or from a famous pastor, you know, who's not a good one. You know, uh, that, that, that is the gospel of the world, my friend. Live your best life now. That is the gospel of the world. And in one sense, there's a little truth in that. I'll just, I'll get out Joel Stein, you know, like, you know, like uh, that, there's a little truth in that. You know, um, if you are not in Christ, if you have not been reconciled to God, you should live your best life now. This really is your best life now because it's only going to get worse. This is the closest to heaven you will ever be, dear friend. The rest is hell. So I guess, guess what? I guess you really should get, you know, get plastered, get drunk, have, you know, all the quote unquote intimacy you want to have now. Do live for now because it will not get better for you. You know, this is the best you got. And if life is terrible for you now, it's only going to get worse, which is why I exhort. I plead with you. Don't die in your sin because you're going to come back to life, too. But an everlasting contempt, which is what our text says here in John chapter five, verse twenty nine be warned. And, I, and more importantly, Christ wants you to experience the resurrection that we are celebrating, that we want to be comforted in, which is to know God forever and ever and ever, you know? It's, it's sort of a crazy thing, you know, when we think about the resurrection. Uh, and, and we're going to get here shortly, but like, this is a resurrection of the body. We'll see that. And maybe I'll just go there real quickly. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you would join me there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15 we see that the resurrection that's going to be spoken about or that, that Paul's describing, this isn't some ethereal spiritual resurrection like, hey, we're going to exist as spirits or whatever. You're going to have a new body. You're going to, you were designed to exist as a physical being. You know, we'll see later in Revelation chapter 20, verses uh, 4 and 5, that there's going to be, a, or uh, yeah, Revelation ch ch chapter 20, there's going to be a new earth, a new heaven and a new earth. Right now, heaven and earth are divorced. They are not together. We were not meant to live the existence we live right now. You know, we, we are not with heaven. They are divorced because of your sin, my sin, and Adam's sin, our father, our ancestor. And because of that, the world groans and grieves because of your sin and my sin. But one day it will not be that one day. One day it will not be that day. One day you're going to have a new body. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 35, it says this, But someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? You fool. That which you sow, remember he's saying fool because he's talking to the Corinthians. They're not a good church, but, you know, heaven forbid we be that. Verse 36, you fool. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of weed or a something else. But God gives it a body just as he wished. 
and to each of the seeds a body of its own. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one flesh of men and another flesh of beasts and another flesh of birds and another flesh and another flesh of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly one and the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars for star differs from star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. I'll stop there for now. Uh, This is just to say you're going to have a body in the resurrection. You're going to have a new physical body. You're not going to be a floating spirit, which is to say even heaven as it is right now. If you were to die right now, if you're in Christ and you go to heaven, you're with the Lord. That's what the text says in Scripture. Heaven, as great it is as it is, it's not all it's meant to be. Heaven, even right now, there's a problem in heaven. The, The people there do not have that glorified body yet. Yet, heaven as it exists with you and me there, is not fully a good place because you don't have a physical body yet. Nothing will be fully complete until the end when God creates a new heaven and a new earth so that you could have a new body to glorify God with that body. You know, God has created us a little differently than the angels. The angels, they do exist primarily as spirits, but not you. You and I were meant to exist as physical matter beings, which is to say, Christians, we have a positive view of the body, you know, and which is why we hate its misuse, whether through sexual morality or self-mutilation or other things like that, because God values your body. So you ought to use your body for glorifying God. And so again, and also this is to say, this is not some pie in the sky doctrine. It's to say you're going to have a new life in heaven, a new body. You know, maybe, maybe you you you've wanted to travel and go places in this earth, and you just can't. You know, prices are high, traveling is too tough, or or maybe if you have a, an ailment or an ailment. Uh, or a condition of some kind, someday, if you're in Christ, that will not be the case. Those things will be gone. There will be no death, no decay, no sickness, no conditions of whatever kind. You're going to have a better body in Christ. It's going to be way better than the Build Back Better. It's going to be the best, you know? Don't worry. It'll be nothing like it. Praise the Lord for that, you know? Um, It's going to be perfect. And so, uh, you know, even as as I was talking to my wife about today's sermon, you know, I was telling her, like, this is going to be amazing. Like, We're going to have new bodies. There's going to be a new earth. Heaven and earth will not be divorced. They'll be together. And, uh, you know, just imagine all the best things of this world, but without all the all the bad stuff and then even better. You know, Uh, there'll be a better L.A. There'll be a better. I don't know. Like, I love Cancun. That's my first. My wife and I used to go there all the time. Like, uh, there'll be a way better Cancun, as amazing as that is. You know, Uh, there'll be like, you know, the Philippines. That's another beautiful place. There's going to be a better Philippines or a better whatever. You know, it's going to be amazing. You know, I joked with my wife, in the, in the life to come, if I see her, I'm going to hide first. So that's how she'll know it's me, you know. Yeah, yeah. So um, we'll see what happens, you know. Um, but this is what we're looking forward to, guys. This is what needs to give you courage and hope and peace. When you hear the headlines, civil war, global conflict, uh, cheated election, a second assassination attempt, all these things, and they are bad. And and we ought to have courage in facing those things. They need to be dealt with. But we have courage, we have hope, and we have peace because we're, lo- we're not looking forward to this life. This ought not be your hope if you're a Christian. We're looking forward to the life to come in Christ. That is your hope if you are a Christian. So I want to take us back now to, well, before we go back to our text, the, the three things were a voice and a shout with the archangel. We saw that in John chapter 5, verse 25 and 29. That's the voice Paul is alluding to. It's the voice of Christ himself, you know, with the power of the archangel, you know, uh, to raise the dead. That voice is for them, for those who are dead in Christ. That might be us, maybe not. Who knows, depending when Christ comes. Um, that's going to be the voice coming for the Thessalonian saints. They're, they're dead. Uh, they're with the Lord now. Um, so that voice is going to wake them up someday or maybe your dead brother or sister or mom or dad or grandpa or grandma in the lord that 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 voice will wake them up to be with christ and the dead in christ will be with christ first but then that brings us to the trumpet if you'll join me now to uh matthew chapter well actually before we go matthew chapter 24 if you'll just join me to our same chapter here in first corinthians chapter 15 verse 52 it says this and first corinthians chapter 15 verse 52 I'll read from 51 for context. But behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and will be changed. So this, there's a trumpet that will play, one for raising the dead and another, according to Matthew chapter 24, which we already read, but I'll go there too. I want us to 
again, solidify these in our mind. In Matthew 24, 29, and 31, there's a trumpet to collect God's elect. So if you die, or not, sorry, if not that you've died, but if you're in Christ, if you haven't died, according to Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 and 31, again, it says, I'll just start from verse 30, actually. It says in verse 30 in Matthew chapter, 21, uh, chapter 24, verse 30, And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the earth, or from one end of the sky to the other. So this is to say, if you happen to be alive when Christ comes back, you will be gathered to him. You're going to be gathered to him. You know, this, it doesn't say this in Matthew, but if you look back in our passage in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, the, the Greek word used here, there's actually two. There's really three words. There's harpaso, elpisin, and um, parousa. Uh, they kind of have a similar meaning, if you will. There's some nuances with each one of them. But when, when, when Paul talks about, hey, we're going to be caught up in the air, we're going to go meet Christ, this is a very particular being caught up. In Latin, uh, it's the word used there is raptos. Maybe you've heard that. It's not referring to rapture. It's referring to rapture. On the contrary, you know, maybe you've heard that. Maybe in left behind or something. You know, uh, not you know, stay away from it. You know, but yeah, stay away. You know, sorry, Jenkins. You know, uh, but sorry, not sorry. But you know, um, this is to say we're going to be caught up. Like when Christ comes back, when that event takes place, the dead will rise. They're going to be with Christ, but so will you. If you're alive when that event happens, we're going to be caught up and go to Christ, but not inconsequentially. That's going to be a gathering of the saints who are alive and dead to greet Christ, to welcome him to this earth. Maybe you recall in Revelation, Christ is going to come back. I mean, we saw it here at Matthew, you know, the, the world, they're going to see Christ come back. They're going to mourn. They're going to be sad that Christ has returned because they hate God. They love their sin. So to see Christ come back is like, oh no, it's true. It's real this is bad really really bad you know that means god's going to judge me for my sin and certainly he will according to revelation there's going to be a lot of death you know um he is the holy punisher if you will you know and so but in that time we see prior to christ coming to conquer this earth the harpies or alpicin or the perus is going to take place or the rapture in other words and the purpose of the rapture is us to greet christ you see when that word perusa or harpazo is used in the Greek. It's supposed to signify an important person, usually a king or a conqueror or a noble who's coming to a city. And then the people of that city, uh, usually a group of them, would go outside the city gates and they would go greet that important person and say, welcome, welcome. It was an act of submission. It was to say, we're not going to fight you or resist you coming into our, our city. We are bowing the knee. We are saying, you are welcome here. You are the Lord. You are ruler here. That is what the rapture is about. It's about coming to Christ as he comes to this earth to claim his rightful ownership of it. It is to come to Christ and say, yes, Lord, this earth is your earth. This land is your land. This is rightfully yours. And so we will welcome Christ. We will be his perusa. We will be his harpaso in that sense. And so that's what uh, Paul means when he talks about us being raised from the dead. So if you'll join me back to our text in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. So we read verses uh, 14 and 15, you know, the dead in Christ will rise first. We also read verse 16 that there, there will be three things to accompany that resurrection, you know, the shout and the voice of the archangel, this is to raise the dead. And then there's the trumpet for gathering the elect. And so that we could be raised from the dead, or will we be caught up in the air so we can greet Christ? And so that brings us to our third, our third comfort in our passage, which is the living and dead saints reunited. Living and dead saints, dead saints reunited. That's verse 17. So it says this in verse 17. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together uh, you know, that's hard paso, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. So we'll go out, we'll greet Christ. Uh, we're going to glorify him. We're going to be welcoming him to the earth. But not only that, but in the first part of verse 17, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. Who's the them? It's the dead in Christ, those who have fallen asleep. So your dead grandma or grandpa or father or mother or brother and sister in Christ, if they are in Christ, this is not the end. And, you know, I think this is really important to know, like, I, I don't mean to over 
emphasize this or, or, or stress this too much, but, you know, we do live in uncertain times. We live in a time where, yeah, violence is talked about so much more frequently. You know, uh, you know, I used to share the gospel outside of uh, Planned Parenthoods and stuff, and I remember, you know, Antifa and those guys would show up and, like, yeah, like, you know, they, they'll rough you up. You know, I got stabbed one time. It was crazy, you know? And, uh, you know, my point is the world is changing. People feel more comfortable using violence to accomplish their means. Some of it's organized, some of it's not organized, you know, and I, I share this to say, like, you know, some people and I remember when that happened, you know, a lot of people say told me you shouldn't go share the gospel of Planned Parenthood anymore. Well, look what happened. You got what you deserve. By no means. There's there's little babies who are being murdered and and and, and killed who don't have a chance in life. You know, uh, we we should be out there sharing the gospel. We should be trying to prevent such evils in our society. That's a part of what turned the pagan Roman ent- empire into a Christianized Roman empire. You know, it wasn't a Christian nation or anything, but it was Christianized, if you will. And so it, it took Christians being courageous, looking forward to the resurrection to boldly take babies out of dung heaps and save them. And, you know, by the way, that was illegal in the Roman Empire. If you got caught doing that, you would die. They would kill you and then throw your body in the dead trash heap with that dead baby. That's what they would do to you. And so, but Christians were bold. They were courageous. Why were they bold and courageous to do such things? Because they had the hope of the resurrection to know this is not it. And so it's, it's okay. We can risk our lives to do what honors God, to obey him, even though when the world says not to do that. And so, uh, but again, I want us to be comforted by the fact that we'll be with those who are in Christ. Um, you know, I, I had mentioned before, like, for example, like, I don't know, uh, like not not just maybe dead grandpas, grandpas, fathers, mothers, but like even a child who's died in the Lord, you know, maybe a miscarriage or something like that. That's a real human being. That's that's a person that God cares about. And, uh, you know, the I'll just share my opinion, my opinion, you know, like like in the Old Testament, when Paul talks about his son dying, he says, you know, I cannot go to him. Uh, but he uh, or no, he cannot come to me, but I will go to him. You know, Jesus, you know, when he tells his apostles not to shoo away the children, he says, let the children come to me. You know, there's it's not to say children aren't sinners or anything like that. But, you know, there's there's a sort of innocence that they have for a time. And then, you know, like uh, I think it's I think it's in Deuteronomy, like when Moses talks about like when children learn to discern between good and evil, uh, then, you know, then you have to hold them accountable to the law, in other words. And so this is to say one of the encouragements of the resurrection and one reason you should not want to miss out on it is, you know, look, you're, you know, yeah, if you've had a miscarriage or if you've lost a baby, um, why miss out getting to know that baby forever and ever and ever, you know, the, this life that you've lived now that you've missed out on that child is going to be so short compared to the life you'll have with Christ. And you'll get to know that child forever and ever the, the life you didn't get to enjoy now, you know, um, it's, it's also to say, you know, there's hope for those little children who are murdered and, and Planned Parenthood and stuff like that, you know. Sorry about that. And uh, But, you know, I, I want you to be encouraged by the reality of the resurrection that this is not the end. You want to see those people. You want to be comforted by that. And who knows, maybe you're someone, I don't know, I if you've had an abortion, like there's forgiveness for that. You know, it's sin. What you've done is wrong and it needs to be repented of. What you've done is absolute evil. You've murdered another human being. And uh, that cannot be dismissed. But the good news of the gospel is even that, even that, that is murder, by the way, it's murder. And yes, that would make you a murderer. But even that can be forgiven in Christ, believe it or not. Can God wipe away your evil? Yes, he can. That can be forgiven in Christ. We serve a great God. And, you know, I, I hope that you know him. I hope that you know that even his love and forgiveness can forgive that. And so many other sins. I mean, I, again, I don't know you guys well enough, but, you know, whatever the sin you have in your life, if Jesus is your Lord, he can forgive you of such great things like that. So I want to bring us to our last comfort, which is we will be with Christ for always. Verse 17, it says, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. So we, we know that we're, there's going to be a resurrection. The dead in Christ will rise first. We're going to be reunited with our loved ones in, in Christ. But furthermore, we're going to be at the Lord for always. That's really the focus of our hope. The basis of our hope is the resurrection. But the focus of our hope is not the dead in Christ. It's not us here. It's actually Christ. Christ is the focus of our hope that we're going to be with him. It's going to be awesome. I hope to see you guys in the resurrection, but I'm going to be busy looking at Christ. You know, um, I love my wife, but I'll be looking at Christ, you know, uh, and that I, that should be your hope too to behold your God, behold the Lord who saved you from your sin. 
And again, if he's not your Lord yet, you're going to be judged in your sin, but I don't, again, believe the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, he could forgive even grievous sins like abortion or other things, you know? And, you know, we condemn that, but you could be forgiven of that. And, and I want to say, be there. Don't miss out on that. Don't miss out on this. And so our last comfort, or our four comforts, I'll just say in closing, our four comforts from our passage again are number one, the reality of the resurrection. That's the basis of your hope. If you're a Christian, if you're going to be out there sharing the gospel this next Saturday, the message we have for people is that there's a coming resurrection. And for some, it's going to be a resurrection to glory and goodness with God. And and to others, it's to judgment. That's what leads them to hell. They're going to be raised from the dead so they can have a body that lives forever and ever in hell. We don't want that. We don't desire that. God himself doesn't desire that. And so we want to share the gospel of people that they can be reconciled to the same God who condemns them. You know, it says in Romans chapter three that Jesus, he, you know, he's God and that he is both, um, you know, he, he justifies us. You know, he's he saves us and he justifies us. And so, again, our the our, the basis of our hope or the first comfort is the reality of the resurrection in verse 14. Our second comfort is the dead will rise first, verses 15 to 16. Number three, the living and dead saints uh, will be reunited with them in verse 17. And lastly, we will be with Christ for always. And so that brings us to the solution of the problem that we had in the beginning. The solution to our problem is really this. We are to comfort one another with the reality of the coming resurrection. So when you hear the new the news headlines, civil war, global conflict, I don't know, rigged election, whatever, you know, there, there's all sorts of stuff. I mean, I just can't keep up with it anymore, you know. But when you hear about all these violent and terrible things, look to the resurrection. Theology matter, got, matters, guys. Theology is not meant to stay on your bookshelf. It's meant to be lived out in your life and planted in your heart, both in your heart and your children's hearts. We need to look forward to this so that we could have uh, we could have peace in this life and not be uh, dis, you know swayed to and fro, tempted to despair. We needed to have hope to look forward to and to have courage to obey to obey God and do what we ought to do. So that ends our sermon. Uh, I'll go ahead and pray. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, thank you for this privilege to preach to your people, Lord. I pray that the reality of the resurrection would be something that these saints would hold close, uh, near and dear to their hearts, God, that they would be people who would be uh, characterized as a resurrection, people who are look for, looking forward to going out of this world to greet you, to welcome you as our king, the conquering king of this world, God. And I pray for those who are not saved here, Lord, those who have not been reconciled to you, Lord, would you help them by making them feel utterly miserable, God, just helping them feel just absolutely terrible until they come to faith in you, Christ, because without you, Lord, this is the best that they have, God. Really high rents, violence, um, bad traffic. This is the all they can hope for in their life, God. After this, it just gets worse. It goes to hell, Lord. Um, I pray that everyone hearing these words, that you would just be glorified through it, God, that it would either uh, strengthen your saints or cause those who are not saved to be saved or if they not be saved, that it would justify you and your condemnation of them. But Lord, I do pray, if I may, Lord, just that you would save everyone who hears this sermon, God, to not just look forward to the resurrection, but to be a part of it, God, that they would be those who are, that they hear your voice when they're long gone and dead, that they would wake up and go to everlasting and glory and goodness, not shame, not darkness, but goodness, love, hope. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.